All right, take your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 7, if you will. Hebrews chapter 7. And um, put that in there. And um, I really want to make sure that what the last thing that we were talking about is understood. Because it's really a key to this thing. And I don't want to go through, and, and, and uh, I don't want to rush through this section without making sure that everybody's under, understanding what's taking place. Uh, so let's do, let, let me try to do it through the, through the Sunday school I, uh, time. We'll probably have a little bit of trivia. And uh, I, I'll ask a couple of questions along the way. And that'll help me know by you looking at me kind of spaced out or are you kind of looking at me and like uh, a calf looking at a new gate uh, to, to say whether or not you understand or not, okay? All right, now we're talking about the priesthood, and we're talking about, uh, we know that there were, how many orders of the priesthood are there? So just raise your hand, don't blurt it out, that way we'll, I can pick on one. How many orders of the priesthood are there? All right, Brother David raised his hand. I like the way he raised his hand. He raised his hand with an answer, too. So that's good. All right. Now, what are the orders of the, uh, of the priesthood? All right, Brother Mike, give me one. Aaron. All right, the priesthood of Aaron, or, or what we call the Arianic priesthood. Okay. Uh, all right. And what's the second one? All right, Miss Deborah. El Melchizedek is, uh, is the, the second order. Okay. Now, let's back up a little bit. Now, what do we know about the order of Melchizedek? For example, who is the one that instigated and I guess you could say uh, consecrated, uh, set apart, God used him to set apart the Arianic priesthood? Who was the one that God used to do that in, in, in the Old Testament? All right, Miss Deborah? Moses. Okay. And... Um, now, Moses was neither a priest or a prophet. He was one of the patriarchs, okay? So, uh, but yet somebody had to do it, so God, so God did it through him. And being, him being the lawgiver, he would, it would stand to reason that he would be the one to set in order what, how things would be, okay? All right? <clears throat> so we know Moses is the one that set it aside. Now, what do we know about, uh, in gist, in, 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 in sort of a summary, what do we know of the order of the Arianic priesthood. In a gist, all right, Brother Mike? Nobody, as far as Melchizedek, no beginning and no end. I'm asking about Arianic right now. Okay. So the gist of it? The gist of it, yes. They, uh, there is a beginning. Moses consecrated. They had to have a, uh, a place of worship, an altar. Okay, they did the work through the tabernacle. Moses set that up as well. Yeah, okay. We're going to talk about that at the end of Sunday school today. All right. But there was a, a, a beginning, and then there was an end to the, basically an end to the Arianic priesthood. Uh, you know, there was, you know, you go back, trace Aaron's lineage all the way back to when he was born, and trace him to when he died. And you can trace his blood lineage, all that. Now, coming to the Melchizedek, what do we know about the Melchizedek uh, priesthood? Mr. Shelby? No beginning, no end. He sort of just comes on the pages of Scripture, goes off the pages of Scripture with no explanation as to either one. Okay? The only thing we know, he was the king of Salem, so he was one, he was one of the first kings of Jerusalem. Okay? Well, when I say there was an ending, there's sort of when the, when the temple and the tabernacle went away, there was no there was no place to do the the, the priest work, and that happened really after Solomon. Um, uh, but the priesthood sort of enter, entered its high, high high mark and high water mark under David, and then waned through uh, David the rest of David's reign and Solomon's reign. And then, when after that, when the when, when the when, when the uh, the nation split and divided, uh, there was no temple after that. 
No, they, they, they were, and uh, it sort of just had an ending in the sense it came de defunct, I guess you would say, okay? Should have kept on, but didn't, okay? Uh, now, with that said, that is a good question. Uh, I don't study too much of this stuff that's going on but uh, in, in, uh, because it, gets, it can really bog you down in study a lot, and maybe I need to get into it, but it, 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 it'll be fun. But I'd get lost in it somewhere, and, and I don't know if I'd find my way back. That would be the way, th the way I would be about it. Uh, there's a group of, uh, of Jews in Jerusalem that, you know, there's been a lot of, lot of uh, archaeological uh, findings that have authenticated the Bible. All the archaeological findings that they find, you know, it really just, it, 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 it shows that the Bible's true and, and that everything that about Christ is true. And, uh, and there's this sect of Jews, and I can't remember who, what they're called, but uh, they, are in, they, they are the ones that are the sort of the keeper of the law. They're the sort of the, the real keepers of the law. They're the ones that uh, the, the, you would call the orthodox, that we're keeping things the way they've always been. You remember back when, same time period, that when, Ab when, when Moses gave the law and gave the design of the tabernacle and gave the design of the, of the Holy of Holies and the Holy of Place and then wrote the specifications for the, uh, for the priesthood, anointed the priesthood, he got all that down. When they started all of that, they, they had a, a flame that, that went into the altar where the, where the high priest and the priest did their work, daily work in the temple. And that's called, the Bible says that's an eternal flame. In other words, that's a flame that God lit and only God can put out. So the question happened when the, when the priesthood and the temple was destroyed, what happened to the flame? What happened to the fire that God lit that never was supposed to go out? So, you know, these Jews say that in the Qumran caverns over there where there's people that have never really been, that you've got a, 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 a sect of nomads over there and Jews that are keepers of the flame. They're the ones that it's still there. Now, there are, and, and I've been told this on one, several occasions, there are uh, um, things that are happening and studies that are happening and uh, through the genealogies to try to identify, Mr. Shepard, this goes to your question, to try to identify an, uh, uh, the lineage of Aaron. They're trying to, they, they, for years they were trying to find, okay, where's the priestly lineage? Where's the priestly tribe? Because we've got to have somebody that's a, that's a direct descendant from Aaron. So they're trying to determine um, who that is, where that is. And I'm told by those that are studying this sect of people that they have located uh, a sect of Jews that supposedly are descendants from Aaron. So then the next thing you got to do is that you got a, a red heifer. You got to go back and find out, do all the study. And I know we hadn't talked about that, and that's a whole other section. You know, supposedly they've identified the red heifer. So uh, the, all of the elements are coming together for these sacrifices to start up again among the Jews. Now, let this, let, let's, here's another trivia question, and I'm going to get to this in a minute uh, and finish this out. Uh, when will the sacrifices begin again in the temple that we know of, what the Bible say about that? Yeah. It'll be it'll be after the rapture and during the tribulational period, and uh, it'll be during the first, huh? The But they're gonna have the temple because they go, they they're gonna have the temple because of the fact is the temple is gonna be rebuilt. 
and uh, and and the, the the supplies. These same people that, that are keepers that say the keeper of the flame is there, the red heifer's been identified, the lineage has been identified, is the same people that say that the materials for the temple are close to the temple site. So that can that can take place. Now remember, the tribulational period does not start when the rapture starts, that, or it's, it's finished. When the rapture takes place, that's not the indicator in the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. And that's, that, that is the misnomer of a lot of Christians. They think, okay, rapture starts, then bam, the seven-year clock starts. That is not what starts the seven-year clock. What starts the seven-year clock with, uh, with, with the tribulational period? Oh, no, that's in the middle of the tribulational period. He does that after the first three and a half years. Uh, Daniel, makes it, make, Daniel makes it clear in Daniel chapter 7, 8, and 9. Very clear. What is the beginning? What starts the seven-year clock? of the tribulational period. If it's not the rapture, what is it? There's an event that happens. There's something that happens that starts that clock. What does it? What is it? Uh-uh. Y'all know the answer. Is it when he's revealed? Uh-uh. Talk it out. Throw stuff out. Come on, talk it out. Throw what you're thinking out. Come on, Brother David. No, sir, I'm waiting on you to give me an answer. <laughs> <laughs> is, it rapture, is it when everybody is able to see? Uh -uh. It is after the rapture. But I mean immediately. Is it when they say peace, peace, peace? Nope. What is one of the things that the Antichrist does after the rapture of the church, uh, particularly dealing with the nation of Israel, that, uh, and that starts to clean the clock? No, that's, that happens in the middle of the tribulational period. When he stands up in the temple and declares himself God, causes the oblation of seats. Three and a half years of the tribulational period has already gone by. I'm sorry? There you go. It's the, it's the covenant with Israel. That's the key. See, nobody's been able to make a covenant with Israel. They're trying now to try to make a covenant with Israel. They haven't done it. Remember, Clinton said he was going to make a covenant with Israel. And I told y'all then he wasn't going to do it. And he didn't do it. And it's not going to be done until Antichrist comes onto the scene. But Antichrist is not going to be revealed until after the rapture. See, we don't know who he is. Now, the rapture could take place in the next five minutes. We don't know that. And the Antichrist could very well be here, and he could very well be in power somewhere that we don't know who he is or where he is or what he is. But the fact is, he's not, quote, revealed as to who he is. He, he's, he could be here, but we don't know. But when, when, when the rapture of the church takes place, think about it. That's going to throw this earth into a, into a, a, a state of, of, of confusion, it's because all of a sudden, thousands and thousands of people all over this globe are going to disappear. Well, the Holy Spirit being taken out will be more than just the people taken out. Well, yeah, but that's going to be because that's, that's going to allow sin just to really have its way. The, but the people are not going to know the Holy Spirit's gone. They're they just going to know that there's been an event that happens where th millions of people are gone, and we're in a mess. because That's, that's a strong delusion. Yeah. Huh? No, 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 no. Now, the strong delusion that Paul talks about in Thessalonians is the, is the, is the, is the, is the, uh, the Holy Spirit sends a strong delusion that people believe the lie. In other words, they're going to believe the lie when Antichrist stands in the temple and declares himself God. They're going to believe it. They're going to believe he's God because, because God's going to send them that delusion that they believe that. Yes. Yes. 
No. The delusion don't have anything to do with everybody leaving. The delusion has a way of everybody believing that Antichrist is the one and let's go believe him and take the mark. That's, that, that's the delusion. And, uh, Can I say something else? Yeah. Um, after the three and a half years, because we, you mentioned that or we brought that up, isn't it at the three and a half year period, from that time you can start counting 1,260 days until the Lord's return? Sure. You can count it from the... I mean, you can count it from the only time set that you can actually count. Now, you can count it from the beginning of the seven years. When that, when, when that peace treaty with Israel signed. Made with Israel. That's seven years. Yes. 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 He's going to be able to do something that nobody has ever done. He's going to be able to bring peace to a chaotic world where millions of people have died or are gone. And I really believe that what's happening, see, now right now what we're seeing here, now I'm off topic just a little bit. We're going to get, I'm going to drag us back in a minute. But when, when you know, have you ever, have you seen in the news, I'm talking about Fox News, I'm talking about Newsmax, I'm talking about all these other major news organizations. What have you heard about in the last probably, I'm going to say six months primarily, maybe a year sort of, but yet in the last six months kind of heavily at times. But now you haven't heard anything about it recently. You've heard a lot about what? Aliens. Yeah. Hadn't you? Heard a lot about aliens. Now, we ain't talking about some, some crazy group out there talking about I'm going to go see Martians. We're talking about the DOD. We're talking about the Secretary of Defense. We're talking about all these people now are talking about, oh, yeah, well, yeah, we, we've had contact with aliens and, you know, but we hadn't told you and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. That got real talked about. Then they rush it. They push it back under the carpet again some more. Then it comes back out again because somebody drags it out. My belief is going, my, my, my kind of thought, I'm not going to be here during the tribulation period. If you're saved, you're not going to be here. There's got to be some kind of explanation to the world. What happened to these millions of people that are gone? Where did they go? You know, he can't get up there and say, well, all those preachers told y'all that, that Jesus was going to be a rapture that happened and they're all going to heaven. They can't give credence to that. They can't say that it was the rapture of the church. But, so what, what, what explanation are they going to give to, to justify and solidify and to calm? And this guy's going to be able to do it because he's going to have this charismatic type leadership that people are just going to just flock to him. I believe it's going to be aliens. Yeah. It, you know, it goes back. So goes TV, goes society. It goes back to the invasions of the body snatchers. It goes back to all these, 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 these you know, uh, ships coming at them. You know, they abducted them, you know, and, and it has happened to be all Christians. We got rid of all this. I was talking about the strong delusion. That's why I was thinking the same uh, Yeah. No, that's not going to, he's just going to be able to calm the minds to that. I'm just, I've always tried to figure out, well, how's he going to be able to do it? You know, there's got to be an explanation. And so that's going to be somewhat of the explanation, I think. Now, I don't know for sure about that, and, and, but I'm just saying it, it's kind of ironic that in the last six months of the last year, we've had a lot of alien talk in, in the news. And, uh, and, and so Antichrist comes onto the scene, makes the, makes the, the, the agreement with Israel, and the covenant... With, thy, with the nation of Israel for one week. That's what Daniel says. Daniel says that he will come, talking about the man of sin, the Antichrist, will come on the scene and make a covenant with thy people Israel. That's what he says, verbatim. Thy people Israel for one week. Based on, when I say we, if you study the scriptures and study where he's going to come from, the Antichrist is going to come from the old Roman Empire. Okay? So it could, it, it, it could be any, anywhere north of Israel. Anywhere. Not necessarily a Jew. 
but he could be a Jew or, or Jewish descent. Yes. And, uh, but uh, when he comes on the scene, he'll make an agreement with Israel. And a lot of, some people think it's the Pope. And it very well could be, because that's directly north of, of, of Israel. If uh, some people, so he's going to make a, an agreement, a covenant with Israel one week. And we know that week is seven years. Because you go back and you count the days, you know, there's so many days of judgment that's been passed upon the nation of Israel. Seventy weeks of judgment. Seventy. Seven zero. And then if you read Daniel 7, 8, 9, and you'll, 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 you'll get into the days because he gets into those 1,260 days. He gets into those 369 days. He, he gets into some days. And he'll, and he'll tell you during those days that after three and a half years, he don't put it three and a half years. He puts the days in there. He, he says after three and a half years, he says he will cause the oblation to cease. All sacrifices stop. They, every, in order for something to stop, they had to start. When are they going to start? Well, the temple's going to be rebuilt. Jews are going to start doing everything they once did to do then. They've got everything in place. Okay? And they're going to start doing their thing again. But then in the middle of the week, the Antichrist goes to the temple, declares himself God. That's when he causes the oblation to cease. And the Bible tells us in Matthew 24, Woe to be to them who give suck in those days, because he says, When you see the abomination of desolation, he says, You flee to the hills. You get out of Jerusalem, because now, Alabama terminology, it's really fixing to bust loose. Now the great tribulation is fixing to take place. Because, let's take back up a minute. What is the tribulation to begin with? What is the tribulation? It's God's judgment on Israel because of their unbelief. He gave them 70 weeks of judgment. Back in Daniel 7, 8, 9, after 69 weeks, or the days accompanying of those day, weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. That's, that's the crucifixion. Jesus died. That's the crucifixion. And then, now we in sort of, that's the reason Bible scholars put the church age from the crucifixion to the rapture. That's the church age. They call that the parenthesis age. They got put parenthesis in there because Paul calls it the mystery. Old Testament didn't talk about it. And, uh, and so, the, the, since there's no talk, there's a parenthesis. God's giving people time to get right. This is an age of grace. Then he'll pick up the timeline with Israel. Because all the timelines doesn't deal with the church. It deals with Israel. That's the reason covenant theology and systematic theology does not go together. That's the reason it's a line. It's a system. God's working a system. He's working a time. He's not, he, and he's working through a people. That's his people, the Jewish people. So in the tribulation, he will again turn his attention back to Jew, the Jews and the prophetic clock will start again. So the next thing on God's agenda is the rapture. That's the next thing. And we don't know when that's going to take place. We have no clue. There's no signs. It could take place in the next five minutes or the next five years, next five, 50 years. We don't know. Whenever God turns to Jesus and says, Son, go get them, that's when it's going, that's when it's going to happen. And we don't know. Now, there are signs. Getting back to you, brother, there are signs, and you can pinpoint when, about, not the, maybe not the particular day, but you can get close. When Jesus is going to come back for the millennial reign. When you see the abomination of desolation, he stands up and declares himself God. You, you know there's only three and a half years left. You can start the clock. You can count. It's going to be on three and a half years. Then Jesus is coming back. And, uh, and he's coming back to the earth to do what? Set up his rule and reign. And reign. Right? That's what he's going to do. After, because that's what starts the seven-year tribulation, period. So the agreement will come after the rapture? After. 
correct. It, well, there's been times in the past when that's happened before, when they've talked a lot about this stuff, and then it all wanes right back down, and it goes to nothing. And uh, it, it's not the first time. I heard about it in the 80s. Yeah, yeah, there was a book written in the 80s by, the, by a man by the name of Rothen, Rosenthal. He wrote a book called 88 Reasons Why Jesus Would Come in, 88, in 1988. 88 reasons why the rapture of Jesus would come in 1988. Well, when 18, 1988 was over with and it didn't, he wrote a book in 1989 saying there's 89 reasons why he missed it in 1988. <laughs> I'm serious. I remember, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Probably not. Probably not. But I really just wanted y'all to understand and we didn't really get too far out of it because of the fact is, back to Miss Shelby's question, they're going to start the, 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 the sacrifices back up again. In order to do that, they've got to establish Arianic priesthood. They've got to find a, 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 the lineage to get a rightful priest because they can't just put anybody in there. They've got to put the, the right person in there. Yes. Probably not. They might. Probably right now because that. They are orthodox, but still, if you can't identify it, you can't identify it. That's the problem. Is the is the is the lineage? I know there's a lot of work going on in in, in lineage in the study of the lineage over there to get the rightful priest. I do know that. Now, yes. Right. Everybody just had to see to the Levi. That's right. Well, after time went by and they fought all these wars and stuff, that kind of filtered out. It was see, like today. It it was it's been over so much time nobody knows where a Levi can be. It was something that from the beginning was gonna be Right, right. I, I, I wondered about that. How come the Le Levites, which held the ceremony, which when Christ died on the cross, that was finished, but there was never no place for a Levite. They, probably, they were assimilated into the nation of Israel. They'd be assimilated and be taken care of one way or the other if nothing else, by the Orthodox. You know, they, they, they would see to it. They, they you know, because you, you, you got your very Orthodox Jews and then you've got your Neo-Orthodox Jews that don't really follow the customs as well. And, uh, but you got those out there that do. Then you got those little nomads out there somewhere that who knows how many Levites are in a cavern somewhere. We don't know. We don't know who else out there in that desert. And neither does anybody else. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot out there. But now the point about this being of the Arianic priesthood ending, and I, I just didn't want to leave it there, that the, uh, that the, uh, the Arianic priesthood is replaced by the Mel Melchizedek priesthood. In verse 15 of chapter 7, it says, And it is yet far more evident, and we read this last week, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there arises another priest. Now, after the similitude, that's Christ. Okay? Who is made not after the law of carnal commandment, that would be Moses. You know, 
you know, ordaining or, or you know, anointing Aaron, okay? And, uh, but after the power of an endless life, for he testified thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That's in Psalm 110, remember? The second mention in the Old Testament of Melchizedek, okay? So because of that, when God set the Melchizedek order, God swore by himself because there was not another to swear by. So Moses gave the Arionic priesthood authority by a carnal written law. God gives power and authority to the Melchizedek priesthood by himself. So that's what makes the Melchizedek priest better than the Arionic priest. That and because of who it was, okay? And I mean, its design is better. Its dyna dynamic is better. Its uh, durability is better. Everything's better in the Melchizedek priesthood than it is in the, in the, in the Arionic priesthood. Now, the crowning reason, and I'm going I'm to tantalize you with this just a little bit. Now, we know there was a change. And, uh, and uh, the Old Testament sacrifice or the Old Testament priesthood would, ban would have banded Christ from being priest. The new covenant is what gives Christ the right to be the, the, uh, the priest. Okay. You got two covenants. You got the Old Testament or the Old Covenant. The New Testament, New Covenant. Okay. Now the underlying life of Christ really starts in verse 23 of chapter 7, and they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. The priesthood didn't change under Christ. Why? He didn't die. He lives forever. Remember, I gave you the example, the reason we stopped and gave that example of the, uh, of the person who accidentally killed somebody. Now the kinsman redeemer is after him to take his life. He makes it to the city of refuge. He stays there until the death of the high priest. If as long as the high priest is living, he's got to stay in that city because if he leaves that city, what happens? He can get killed. But if the high priest dies because of his death, it frees the, 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 the person that did it. Jesus died on the cross, frees us of our sin, but Christ wrote, resurrected the third day and he lives forevermore interceding for you and for me as our high, what? As our high priest. And so he, he's forever there. So here, when we get into chapter 8, it says, now let me read just a few verses, just a verse or two here. Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. Key word. The writer said, let me summarize this. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Now, I want you to think about that. And then verse 2, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, key there being true, true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. So now what is the writer saying? Before that high priest under the Arianic priesthood could go into the sanctuary or the Holy of Holies to make sin, you know, the exchange for blood for sin on behalf of Israel, what did he have to do first? He had to do an atonement for himself. Our high priest doesn't have to do that. So now he gets to go where they couldn't go before they couldn't go, and that is straight to the throne room. Now remember, when you typically go to the throne room, what do you would do? If you and I went into the throne room of God, what would we do? Die. No, not die. I'm, I'm talking about if we went in to see God and Say, okay, what, what, what would you do in a throne room? You're going to kneel. You're going to kneel. What did Christ do when he went to the throne? He sat down at the right hand of God, which is a place of what? Power and equality. Big difference. 
Big difference. So you want a man going in there doing your work for you? You want God going in there doing your work for you? That's the difference right there. We'll pick it up in chapter 8 next week, okay? God bless.